Can you hear me now? <clears throat> Let's all stand and uh, as I read the word, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glorify in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, and hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man one would dare to die. Now these two next two verses, listen real close. But God commendeth his love toward us, and then when we, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were in enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for this day. And just, Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and work to serve thee. Father, we pray for the many that are sick and shut in. We pray, Father, that you bless them. Maybe they'll be able to watch this uh, service in, in person online. There's, we pray, Father, that Or stand back up. <laughs> and then we're going to do head, shoulders, knees, and toes to get good exercise this morning, all right? <laughs> How is everybody? Y'all are looking good. <laughs> she cleaned my glasses before I got here and everything, so I mean it this morning. Not that I don't mean it other times. All right. God is good, amen? It's been a good, busy week. If it's a busy week, it keeps me out of trouble, right? I don't know about you, but it works for me. All right, we're going to sing this morning, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty. Let's sing out, right?
Good morning, church. It is so good to be here in God's house this morning. If you are visiting with us, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before you leave out in the foyer, we have a small gift for you and a Connect card that we would love for you to fill out so that we can document your visit with us today and be able to reach out to you. Uh, and so stop by at that uh, in the foyer there at the table, uh, manned by our youth before you leave today. Uh, just a couple announcements. First, there is a ladies' Bible study that is starting on Thursday, June the 13th. It's going to be from 6 to 8 in the Go Center uh, every other Thursday. Uh, and so it's going to be uh, Discerning the, the Voice of God series. Uh, Priscilla Shire is the author of that book, and it will be a great study for any of the ladies that want to be involved in that. If you'd like to be in that Bible study, please sign up in the Next Step Hub out in the Welcome Area. Uh, so that we can make sure that you have the material for that. Also, uh, be in prayer. Uh, on, on Monday, our children leave for Center Kid Camp, and so they will be in Campbellsville, Kentucky, there on the university uh, for the week uh, as they uh, worship and study, learn more about God, and have an opportunity to uh, be with their peers, uh, and it'll be a great, a great uh, opportunity for camp. We've got a lot of camps coming up and a lot of things that are coming up throughout the summer, so I encourage you, if you didn't pick up a bulletin, to make sure that you get one because there is a calendar of all of the events uh, that are in the month of June, uh, and so make sure that you have that. Put that on your refrigerator, take a picture of it, put it in your phone, just keep that so that you have a way to be able to know all of the good stuff that's happening in the church. Also, make sure that you have marked your calendars for July the 21st to the 24th, uh, that is our Vacation Bible School, uh, and so and we still do need volunteers, and so uh, you're going to get a blessing out of this, and I would encourage you, if you've not already signed up to be a volunteer for Vacation Bible School, to do that. No matter what your giftedness is, we need your help you know, to be a part of that. Uh, there are ways to serve uh, in the kitchen, in recreation, in crafts, uh, as a teacher in class, uh, singing and dancing on the stage as uh, the kids worship. So make sure that you are signing up to be a volunteer. And also, the pre-registration for that has already begun, and you can re uh, register on our website, and that's rs1.church. And so you can go on there and go ahead and get your children registered um, before that event begins. All right, at this time, I would ask that our ushers come forward uh, as we take up our offering. Uh, I want to pray this morning as, as Brother Johnny is going to be bringing the message this morning. I'm excited to hear you, man, and what God has laid on your heart. Such an important message as we have been uh, preaching through the gospel here uh, at the church. Uh, and this morning is the, the response. And so we want to pray that God moves in Johnny and in the hearts of those people that need to respond to the gospel today. So if you would bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be able to get up this morning and come into your house and have a place to worship you. And Father, I thank you for giving us the ability to be able to sing praises to you. And Father, I ask that you would just allow us to have uh, just focus this morning on you. Father, that all the distractions that are around us and in the world and the busyness that has happened throughout the week would just, would just take a break uh, for just this time as we come in your presence to worship you and learn more about who you are and your character. Father, I pray for Johnny as he delivers the word this morning, Father, and I pray that you would just use his mouth as a way to share the gospel and that people would hear the good news and that they would respond to that. Father, I pray that if there's someone here that's listening right now, whether it be in this building or online, Father, maybe even farther on in the future, that they, as they hear these words, that you would use them to draw them to you, and that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, I pray as we take up offering this morning that we would give with, with, with joyful hearts, Father, in the abundance that you have provided for us. And Father, I ask that you would use these offerings for the furtherment of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.
If you will, stand back. Let's, uh, we're going to sing together a really amazing song. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Sing it out, church. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now the gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not paint by the blood and in his name in his freedom we are free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me sing praise the father praise the son praise the Spirit, three and one, God majesty, praise forever to the King of peace. Sing it out, just your voices. Praise the Father.
was that king who went to a cross that we might have freedom and know what that is like. We're going to sing this amazing song, old song. It means a lot to my heart because of what he did on that cross. So church, I want to hear you sing it out like you believe it this morning. Father God, I pray right now that you just hear our cry. That the old rugged cross still means the most. 
for what you did there. Lord, I'm thankful. My heart is changed because of it. Lord, I pray today for Johnny as he comes and brings a message. Lord, just bless him. Lord, give him the message we would need to hear. Open our hearts and minds, Lord. For we love you and we praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Surprise, I'm preaching this morning, right? Got a great congregation this morning. I'm excited to finish out Christian series on what is the gospel. Today is the fourth and final sermon in this series, and it is dealing with response to the gospel. Just a little recap, right? We have gone first in that first day about God, the perfect and righteous and all-knowing creator, created all things and everything, including us, man, to be in fellowship with him because he loves us. And the second time we had man, right? We rejected our creator by sinning against God, and that fellowship is broken. And because of our sin and imperfection, we cannot be with God or be judged by God for our sin. And then Christian brought in Christ, how God did not want us to be left in this rejected state, but loved us and sent his perfect and righteous son to pay the price for our judgment, our wrongdoing. Through Christ's perfect sacrifice, he paid the punishment for us by nothing we have done, but by the grace of God. By his death and resurrection, we can now rejoin God in fellowship through our personal faith and repentance of sins. That being said, church, let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Here we have Peter, he's bringing this sermon. It's a really powerful passage right here if you read it from the, the, the entrance of the passage in chapter 2. But right here, we're kind of at the, the latter half of it. After pre Peter has already preached this sermon, we have here in verse 36, it says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear God, we love you and lift you up this morning. God, we have heard your gospel message, and we have seen your truths. God, we have seen the evidence of, of your life. We have read your scriptures. God, and through this series, I pray that those in this room have come to know you closer and closer, and come to know how to share your good news. But God, for those in this room today that do not know you personally, God, I pray that you invoke in them this decision to respond to this gospel. God, you would invoke in them a decision just to step out in faith and repenting of their sins to be with you. Amen. Now in this passage, right, Peter, after he says this, and the people ask, right, they're asking themselves, what shall we do? They hear the gospel presented, Peter preaches it clearly and evidently, and yet the people want to respond. That is what the gospel does to us, right? When we hear this good news, it invokes a response from us. And so Peter helps walk them through that response. And so that's what we're going to do here today is walk through this response. And the great and glorifying part of this is at the end, and in verse 41, Peter talks about how 3,000 people came to accept Jesus and were baptized, right? That is an evoking response and people coming to the altar. We're going for 3,001 today, right, guys? We're going to try to beat that, right? No, maybe not. It's okay. We'll go for it, right? Not a lot of, I don't know, there's nothing over there. Right? That's what we're focusing on today is response to the gospel. Now, responses are interesting, right? Responses, uh, kind of invoked responses especially, are very interesting. Uh, because sometimes we don't know what's going to come out, what's going to happen, right? Especially when it deals with sports, right? Some of us can get an invoked response from sports if there's a call that is made. That's kind of a little bit upsetting, right? That invokes a response out of us, right? I'm sure we probably wouldn't want to repeat some of those responses here today, but sometimes it, it invokes something in us, right? There's lots of things like little television jingles, right? If I said the words Red Robin, it would invoke you guys to say what? Right? Right? We'll get a yum, maybe an amen later, right? We'll do a lot of things today, right? And so that's invoking your response, right? Some things just happen from us. I was officiating a wedding this weekend, my first wedding. It was a, a big deal for me. It went good. They're married, right? So mission accomplished, right? But when I'm talking to the bride and groom, I'm asking them and invoking a response out of them to say, I do. If they didn't, right, it'd be really awkward. So we got that response out of them. Uh, and responses in life can be the same way. They can be very simple or very complex. A lot of people love to get 
complicated responses when we ask them questions, right? And sometimes you're just like, eh, just give me a yes or no, right? You just want to just cut to the chase and say, just make it plain, right? Make it neat, nice and easy for us to understand. All I need is a yes or no response. And so realistically and honestly, this gospel message that's presented is a yes or no standpoint, right? It is a yes and no response system. We ourselves can make it complicated and do all this dragging out and explanations as to why I'm saying no or, or why I'm looking to say yes, right? But in, in reality, it is a yes or no. And in, in the most craziest of ways, this yes or no response has everlasting changes, right? Has, has, has your entire life shattering changes depending on your response. And so if someone was to simply say no to the gospel, right? No. Honestly, that doesn't do a whole lot to them because they still stand in a state of rejection to God. They still are saying no to a changed life. They're still saying no to anything really being different in their life. No really keeps them kind of just at the same standpoint. And that's why so many are so likely to say no to the gospel because they look at their own life and how they've made it and what's, what, what it looks like and they'd rather just say no. And so nothing happens. They're still rejected. They're still completely in sin. But then the wild part is when someone says yes to the gospel, that alters who they are forever. Saying yes to the gospel is the most life-changing thing that can happen to you. It absolutely changes not just your life here on earth, but your eternity forever. You now go from being dead, right, in your sin, but being alive in Christ, saying yes to this gospel truth. Saying yes to this is the greatest thing that can ever happen right? The Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we get to have this personal relationship with Jesus, saying yes to the gospel. Absolutely, radical change occurs forever after that moment. Saying yes to that truth is the greatest news ever, and that is what the response is today that we're looking at, is this response to this good news. Now, some of us, right, should have pretty good reactions to good news. If I say, Jackson, you got a million dollars, boom, that's some great news, right, for Jackson, I'm sure he's pretty pumped, right? He's going to probably lose his mind. If I give somebody a car, that good news is going to make you flip out. If I say, hey, this sickness you've been struggling with for a long time, you're healed, right? We got you. It's taken care of. Those are all great news, right? It's all good news that we were going to lose our mind over. We'd probably jump up, scream, all this stuff, right? Lose our minds. But the only reason you wouldn't look to lose your mind is if you didn't think it was true, is if you thought that good news was not real, is if you thought what was being said to you had no merit to it, had nothing to go with it. You didn't think anything about it. It's a scam. It's bonkers. It doesn't make any sense. There's no way that could be true. But here in this good news, it requires a response, a response unlike any other. We see it over and over again in the Bible. In Mark 1, 15, it says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Acts 2, 38, we just read this. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 20 and 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're focusing on today in this response. Faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. It could be repentance and faith. The big thing we're focusing on is that they both have to happen together. That it's two sides of the same coin. You don't get one without the other. There's no way to, a person can turn from sin and then later trust in Jesus or trust in Jesus and then later turn from sin. When we turn to Christ for salvation from our sins, we are simultaneously turning away from the sins that we are asking Christ to save us from. So we're going to dig into both faith and repentance and what true saving faith looks like and what that repentance looks like as well. It doesn't matter which one we talk about first because we're saying they occur at the same time, and we'll get into that in a little bit. As we look at this response, it is this conversion at salvation, right? And conversion literally means turning. So we're literally turning away from something. And this is a spiritual turning from sin to Christ. And that's how repentance and faith works, right? So repentance is turning away from sin, and faith is turning to Christ. And so we see how that turning all works together all in the same accord. We're going to start off talking about faith. Now, faith in Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. Now, even though we're talking about true saving faith, I don't want to get you guys all theologically messed up and think that this true saving faith, you don't remember reading that, right? Or, or, or specifically when you hear the word faith in the Bible, we're talking about this faith in Jesus, but I'm specifying it to differentiate for this purpose. Now, I believe that the Bible talks about three different things that make up 
true saving faith. And that's knowledge, approval, and then personal trust. So we're going to go through all three of those and how all three of them together make up this true saving faith in Jesus. First off, we have knowledge. We know it is necessary to have some knowledge about Jesus and what he has done. When the gospel is shared, obviously it's articulated about God and who he is as our creator, about man and our situation, and about Jesus and his death and resurrection, his life that he lived perfectly. All that is knowledge that we are bringing into the table. Those are all facts that we're accepting to that. In Romans 10, 14, it says, how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? Right? This, but this knowledge of Jesus is still not enough right, to be a true saving faith. Just because we know of Jesus does not mean that we are saved. Paul even talks about this in Romans 1, 32. Though they know God's righteous decrees and those who practice such things, they deserve to die not only because of the things they do, but they give approval to those who practice to them. Paul is talking about people that know of God. They know of God's laws and his ways, but yet they're still living wickedly. So that shows, evidently, that they don't have this true saving faith, even though they acknowledge who God is. They believe that God is there, right? They understand the facts of God. And most importantly, we get into James chapter 2, verses 19, when it talks about even the demons know who Jesus is. They believe in his whole story. They know he was crucified and resurrected. The demons themselves believe that. We all agree that demons aren't saved? Probably, right? Demons do not have a true saving faith, even though they believe in Jesus, even though they know the facts are true about Jesus. They understand that truth. And so for some of us, we have to recognize and realize, am I saying that I truly believe in Jesus in this way? Or am I going into this faith in a whole different way with personal trust and approval and knowledge? So we see that knowledge is not a saving faith. But then we go to this next part of approval. So we have this knowledge presented in front of us about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. But there has to be this approval of facts that come about, seeing that these things that Jesus did, and then approving that they're true. Approving that you believe that they happen. We see here in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here we have Nicodemus, a Pharisaic ruler, right? He's a guy of the Pharisees. He understands the law, but he also understands who Jesus is. He sees that he is a man of God and that he cannot do these signs and wonders without being apart from God. He knows that he is with God. And so he sees the stats, he sees the facts, he sees these miracles that he's doing, and he says, yes, I do think that you are of God. And so we see that knowledge and approval. But yet it makes no mention to Nicodemus' personal salvation, that he does not personally believe that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. It does not make mention of his commitment to that truth. He can see the facts and understand them and approve of them even without still putting his personal trust in that standpoint. Just as in math, right, I love math, uh, you have seven times six is 42, right? Hope we can all agree on that, right? Those facts are pretty cut to the point, right? I even could probably deduct and do reasoning and do this proof about why that is true, right? And see the evidence there and see the factuality in that. But I don't have to have this personal commitment, right, to this truth, to this evidence, to have anything change in my life, right? I don't have to make this personal commitment to those numbers and what they mean to really change my life, and so we see that, that the facts and the evidence don't have to radically change us. That does nothing to us. That just sits there and says, oh, we agree with these facts and evidence. It all requires a personal commitment to that thing. And in this case, a trust in Jesus. And thirdly, that's where we put it all together. We see these facts about Jesus. We approve of these facts. But then we have to step out and personally trust Jesus in these facts. We see the evidence presented through the Bible, throughout history, throughout all of time, right, say that Jesus Christ is Lord, that what he did on earth was true, and that he lived that perfect life, dying for my sins and for yours, and rising back from the dead. All these facts are out there in front of us, but yet this third culmination of these, this faith, this true saving faith, is personal trust in Jesus, is a stepping out, stepping out from ourselves, our own way of doing things, and committing ourselves to his way, believing that his promise will be carried out, that he will do exactly what he said he did, believing in that death and resurrection, and depending on him to save us. That he is alive today, and I believe in that truth. And I believe that because he is alive today, he will let me join him forever in eternity. Now, this is why salvation is so amazing 
because it is the great acceptance of the greatest truth that we can't save ourselves and that I'm going to trust this Jesus to save me. It's going to take a lot to step out in true faith, to see the facts out in front of us, see the evidence, approve of those facts, approve that evidence, and then believe personally that he's going to save me. And that is the issue with today, right? Is that faith is thrown out there as a really weird term. Right? A lot of times it happens in sporting events or in really unlikely to happen situations. The old have a little faith, you know? When you say to somebody, have a little faith, right? It's, they're they're going to get up from 50 points down, right? They're going to make it, right? Have a little faith, right? In the no-win scenarios, that term gets thrown around. And so this evidence, right, is, is what's kind of poisoned our minds a little bit in, in culture today is that this faith term is not in the way that it's actually used in the Bible. We use it in ways that have no connotation to what it really is. If we say have a little faith, it makes it seem like it's not going to work out, that it's just a dead-end street. But the have a little faith that I'm talking about is in the John 3, 16, when it says blatantly, for all who believe in him shall not perish. Meaning that if I put my faith in Jesus, that I will not die, that I will not be cast out for all eternity, that if I put my faith in Jesus, that he will rescue me, and I'll get to live with him forever in eternity. That kind of faith is what we're putting out in front of people, trying to avoid the cultural stigmas and say, this is the faith that I truly believe in, this true saving faith about him being my Lord and Savior. Jesus desperately wants us to have this personal trust. He desperately wants this relationship with us. He desperately wants us to go to him. That's why he's asking us to step out. And he mentions over and over again as to why he wants us to step out. It's because he's there for us. It says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. In John 7, 37, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, It says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, time and time again, makes reference to wanting us to personally step out because he wants to be there for us, because he is there for us. He's asking us to personally trust him with everything we have. And trust is a very hard concept for us to get through. I'm sure a lot of you guys are hard at trusting people, right? It's just in our nature, right? It's in our nature just to worry about me, myself, and I. It's just to really focus inward and say, I can't trust this situation. I can't trust the circumstance. It's got to be perfect, right? Even if all the evidence are perfectly read out, we're still scared to trust. And that's what makes this accepting the gospel message so difficult because we have a hard time trusting each other. But Jesus is trying to show us over and over again, he desperately wants us. He desperately wants us in his arms to be there with him. This trust that I'm talking about stepping out in is life-changing trust. It's understanding the gospel message, seeing what Jesus puts right in front of us for us all to accept, and then us stepping out in faith in that. Now, on this flip side of the coin is repentance. Now, repentance and faith, like I said before, have to go hand in hand in this saying yes to the gospel, in this response to the gospel. And repentance is a heartfelt sorrow for sin, a renouncing of it, and a sincere commitment to forsake it and walk in obedience to Christ. Now, Repentance is not a system that you have to do after you've been faithful enough, right? You're not trying to be faithful enough in Christ, and then you gain your repentance card, and then you're good to go, right? It's not something where we're, after we accept Jesus and we become faithful, then after we live that good, godly life, then we can repent of our sins. Repentance happens at conversion, right? Repentance and faith occur together. You are choosing to reject a life of sin and look towards a life with Christ. Repentance is not something that happens in the backside or on the forefront. It is all us rejecting what we have been doing before God, before God into our lives. Now, this action, obviously, is not something that's taken lightly. Being repentant of your sins is not something where you're just saying, you know, I feel bad about that. I I really am sorry that I've been doing that, and then continue to live in it and to do it, right? It's, It's not just committing this over and over again and then hopefully just stepping away for a little bit and walking back into it, but this repentance of sin is actually a spiritual, a, a spiritual thing of saying, I reject who I was. I reject my old self. I reject my lifestyle to be with Christ. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, as it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief 
so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Leaving that this true godly repentance comes not just from us, from our sorrowful actions, but our actions against God. But that we're forsaking of the sins we are committing against God. We are admitting, not just mentally, but spiritually, that we have done wrong. That we are saying to God, the life that I once lived, I live no longer, and I choose to follow you. This is where we get a little more intense with, with as far as this faith and repentance aspects in the Bible. We have to make sure a lot of scripture points towards faith alone to be saved. And I'm not hearten that. I'm not going against that at all. But we're looking at faith and repentance is always put together, even if it does not make mention of repentance. Earlier we had read about repentance to be baptized. When they had asked the apostles, what should we do? They even said, repent and be baptized. Make no mention of faith in that, in that scripture. And then here we see in scripture that it talks just about faith in Acts 16, 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. In Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The emphasis in that part of the scripture is having a belief in Jesus, a faith in Jesus. I'm not just counting that. It is what it requires, a faith in Jesus, that we understand who he is, the knowledge that he presents in front of us, the, the, his livelihood, the acceptance of that, but also that we are putting personal trust in him as our Lord and Savior. But that goes hand in hand with our repentance. Like I said, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot be serving ourselves to sin, but also serving Jesus. We have to reject it in order to follow Christ. There's an illustration, a depiction of someone holding all of their sin. It's basically a big old bag of garbage. And then they have Jesus right here, and they're trying to somehow embrace Jesus, but still hold on to the stuff that they're looking at. So in this act of conversion, if we're saying yes to the gospel, it has to be a release of that old self, release of the sin, the things that we're holding on to so dearly, thinking it's going to do something for us. It's a release of that and turning away from that commitment and going towards your commitment to Christ. It is that that we look at in this response. It is that that we have to look at each and every time. In this book that this series has been based on, the What is the Gospel book by Greg Gilbert, the author writes, I tell you what every Christian whose faith is in Christ alone will do. By God's grace, they will simply and quietly point to Jesus, and this will be their plea. Oh God, do not look for any righteousness in my own life. Look at your son. Count me righteous, not because of anything I've done or anything I am, but because of him. He lived the life I should have lived. He died the death I deserve. I have renounced all trust in my plea in him alone. Just by me, oh God, because of Jesus. In this faith and response, I don't want to overcomplicate this. If you're saying yes to the gospel, you're stepping out away from the things of this world. You're stepping out away from who you once were to say yes to this truth you've been pre presented with. It's saying yes to a life altered completely. It's saying yes to the one who died for your sins and rose again. It's stepping away from the things that we've been clinging on to and towards Christ, radically changing your life forever. I don't want anyone to get confused today and think, Am I truly saved? Am I, am I, are these things rolling around in my head? Do I really have a true saving faith? But more as a reiteration of saying, when you made that plea to God, when you cried out to him in repentance and faith, right? am I still living that life that is geared towards him? Am I still living that life towards Jesus? Am I still trusting him personally with my life? Understanding that it doesn't matter anything else that I trust, solely relying on him, sole reliance on what he has set out to do in front of me how he has changed my life radically. That is what I'm looking to respond to, rejecting my old self and looking towards him. Through the gospel message, we've seen it presented over and over again. And I'll finish by sharing the gospel one more time and, and just look at this invoking of response. But I also, at the time of, of this invitation, I want us to also look at just ourselves. And after we've presented this gospel message over and over again, maybe a conviction in our own hearts to say, do I know how to share the gospel? Do I know how to present it to others? Can I walk someone through the gospel message? Can I present it in front of them and walk them through true saving faith? Can I help lead and guide others in this message? That's what God puts in front of all of us, right? In the Great Commission, he commissions all of us as believers to reach the nations, to reach not just here in this county or in the United States or out in this, this side of the hemisphere, but the whole world globally looking to reach them for the goodness of God, for the kingdom work, sharing his good news, life 
changing news? Can I myself preach and teach that gospel message and walk someone through that? That's what the Bible is all about. The Bible is a story about how all of us were created by God for relationship with God. We are loved by God, but we have sinned against God. We've all turned aside from God, his ways to ourselves and our own ways, and we've rebelled against him. Yet God in his love for us has not left us in this state. He has come to us in the person of Jesus, and he lived the life we could not live, no sin and absolute perfection. And even though he had no sin to which to die, he chose to die and pay the price for our sin. He died the death we deserve. And then he didn't stay dead for long, but three days later he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death, so that anyone, anywhere, turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus as Savior and Lord of their life, will be forgiven of all their sins and be restored to right relationship with God. Church, this is his message. This is the biblical truth. This is his gospel. At this time, guys, I just want you really to reflect on your own life. There's someone in this room that does not know Jesus personally. I pray that you take this time right now to pray over that person. And if you're in this room and you do not know Jesus personally, I take, just take time to pray in your own life and say, God, who are you? What do you want with me? What do you have for me, God? God, show me who you are. Reveal that truth. And show me the way. Let's pray. Dear God, I love you and lift you up. God, that you might be glorified this morning. God, that you would just be the truth in our lives. And God, if we accept your truth, God, that we would look to you in all things. And God, I pray that as this gospel has been articulated Sunday after Sunday, God, that you have worked in someone that has just Sunday over and over again, just not wanted to come down, just not wanted to acknowledge what you're doing in their heart, God, what they're doing in their life. God, I pray that you would just invoke in them, God, just the boldness to come to the altar and to seek you. God, that you would look to them, God, pull them out of their comfort zone and say, do not say no today. That you would invoke a yes out of them, God, invoke a response out of them for your glory and your glory alone. Amen. Let's stand. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all the healing streams.
you guys can be seated. Thankful to finish out this series, guys. I'm, I'm glad it's summertime and it's kicking off a lot of different things. Uh, like Jarek said, we have Cinder Kid this week, leaves Monday, so tomorrow they head out, and then our crossings camp for youth leaves this Saturday, and so we'll actually not even be here next Sunday. It's going to be a, a crazy couple of weeks, uh, and the best part about those two camps is I know the gospel is shared. I know the good news is preached over and over again in almost everything they do. Actually, it is in everything they do. That's their, their whole deal is that they have the gospel in everything they do. It's incredible to see it work sometimes, especially in the cafeteria or in other ways. You're just like, how do they do it? They still do it, right? It's amazing. Uh, and so at this time, I'm actually going to ask for all the chaperones of both Century Kid and Crossings. If you're in this room, please come on down. Uh, we're going to take this time to pray over our chaperones. They've taken time out of their week, out of their busy schedule to invest into these kids, invest in these students. And so it, it's a big deal because uh, the gospel is going to be shared. Uh, and a lot of times the, the staffers will always look to push those students back to us in, in looking for that response time. And so I, I pray just over this group that they might uh, just be ready and willing just to serve in whatever ways are necessary and possible because it'll be a long, long, long week, but it's going to be a great, great, great week. So Jarek, if you would, uh, we got a couple more coming down. Uh, if you would pray over us, because I'm going to. So, so first, uh, let's give uh, Johnny some credit for the great sermon that he preached this morning. We, uh, we're, we're, we're blessed here to have a, a, a youth pastor that is preaching the gospel to our youth constantly uh, and leading them in a way that they know Christ and know him better and are, are more Christ-like in their lives. Uh, so I'm thankful to be on staff with you and, and all that you do, effort that you put forth to my kids and many, many others. Uh, and so, and I'm also thankful for these uh, the chaperones and, and like Johnny said, giving up their time. And so I do want to pray over them. And so if you would bow with me as we pray to dismiss this morning. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for opportunities to serve you. Father, we thank you for just calling us to the purposes that you have in our lives. And Father, I pray and giving thanks for each one of these people that have stepped out in their faith and given of themselves, that have sacrificed their time and their effort and, and even financially to be able to serve the youth and the children here at Russell Springs First Baptist Church. And Father, they're, they're going to miss sleep uh, and comforts of home and their loved ones for a period of time. And Father, I pray that you would just bless them. Father, I pray that you would strengthen their bodies for this time, that they would be able to, to work and do the things that you have put before them. Father, I pray for the students that they will impact. And Father, I pray that, that their lives would be an example to them. And Father, that as, as these children and as these youth come to these, these chaperones and leaders, that Father, that, that they would have the words that, to say, to be able to encourage them and to strengthen their faith. And Father, if there's, if there's a child or youth that's going on the camps in these next couple weeks that doesn't know Jesus, Father, it is our prayer that, that they would be able to put their true faith in Him, that they would repent of their sins and that they would forever be saved. Father, I pray that you would use these leaders to sh boldly share that message, that, that they would be able to lead, lead one of these young ones into your loving arms. And Father, we thank you for, for what you've done here at the church, so many young people. And Father, those that are here, Father, I pray that you constantly remind us to pray uh, for them, these chaperones and the children. And Father, I pray that you would use us here at home to be able to impact somebody else's life that we come in contact with us. Let us be bold with the gospel too. And so Father, we thank you for all of these things and for allowing us to be here this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Y'all have a good week. Let's stand. Praise God from whom all bless.